and online courses of various sorts. And I actually had the uh, I've had the opportunity to teach a couple of MOOCs, uh, Big Day in Education. It's been a fun experience, opportunity to reach out to a lot of people, and also an opportunity to get some really great data for my research. So mm -hmm. it's been awesome. We're going to relaunch it uh, probably in about six to nine months. I'm in the middle of a move between universities, so that's put a little bit of a delay on things. But in our next iteration, I'm kind of excited because we're going to build in uh, some uh, intelligent tutoring system features for helping guide students between content that no MOOC's ever done before. So, very excited. These systems create massive amounts of log data. And these days, most log data is in actually pretty straightforward formats. But go back about 15 years, and it was in just these completely messy trace formats, which uh, was a great uh, source of excitement and fun during the early years of my career. Another big source of data we get is grading outcome data. Uh, this graph comes from a paper by Alex Bowers, a professor at Columbia University, who studied um, and clustered the patterns in student grades over the course of their entire school. Uh, this is the data for one school in San Antonio, Texas. I'm sorry, one district. Student engagement data. You know, it used to be that engagement was something you'd research, but it'd be these researchers taking these really laborious notes in field settings. These days, uh, there are apps which you can use to collect a lot of data really quickly. And um, the one group of researchers in Chennai, India, is actually deploying uh, researchers using these apps in every single public school in the corporation of Chennai. Um, another big project using this is the Black Rock Forest Consortium in, um, in upstate New York. So people, the idea being that this is a way to get a lot of data fairly quickly. This data gets you pretty large scale. You know, you've got a lot of data from systems used by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students a year, and a whole university system data on things like course taking and outcomes. So data in education used to be very different. It used to be dispersed, hard to collect, and small scale. Um, my colleague Alex Bowers uh, once told me this story that I thought was kind of fun about how when he was doing his dissertation, um, he had to copy the records for the school at, from uh, paper records onto his laptop. And he was able to do about five or six records per day. And these days, even though big initiatives like, uh, uh, what's it called, the big one that got closed uh, a year ago, founded by the Gates Foundation, and uh, well, anyways, there was, I can't remember the name, Inbloom. Inbloom. Anyone heard of Inbloom? So in move that shut, uh, that didn't go forward, but even still, uh, states and districts are collecting this data in ways that we can get at it and do the process much more easily. Uh, another source of uh, data today are things like the National Student Clearinghouse. Who here has heard of that? Great. So give some background and feel clearly. Um, <laughs> National Student Clearinghouse uh, stores records of where every student enrolls in college in the United States. It was originally developed as a way to make sure that students weren't collecting financial aid data from two places at once but it's since become a really great resource for research. The PAR framework is um, a collaboration among universities. Uh, well, it started as a collaboration among universities on collecting retention data and trying to develop models of student retention. Interestingly, it actually got bought by a for-profit company, which is the first time I've ever heard of a non-profit consortium getting acquired by a for-profit company. But, so it's now uh, owned by a uh, company. Another big source is the PSLC data shop. Has anybody heard of that? So the PSLC Data Shop, Pittsburgh Science Learning Center Data Shop, is the largest public repository on data for the interaction between students and educational software and online learning platforms. It's got over 250,000 hours of data of students using online learning platforms, uh, from cognitive tutors from Carnegie Learning, from the assistance platform, and other large educational platforms. And that 250,000 hours corresponds to over 30 million student actions and what the systems did in response. So again, is this big data? Clearly, Google is not going to look at 30 million data points and say, yes, this is big. But compared to what education researchers had, say, 15 years ago, it's enormous. I remember in 2004 giving a talk at the Computer Human Interaction Conference and saying, we had 70,000 uh, data points. And everyone went, ooh. <laughs> and nowadays, if I give a talk and say, we had 70,000 data points, people go, is that really enough to analyze what you're doing? So times have changed. As um, Shereen was kind enough to mention, uh, I was, I'm involved and have, was involved in the early leadership of the International Educational Data Mine Society, 
which is one of the two big scientific societies uh, for research in this area. The other one being the Society for Learning Analytics Research. Um, very compatible goals, uh, some differences in methodology. Probably not particularly important or relevant for today. These two societies have the joint goal of exploring the big data. And I put in quotes because you know one person's big data is another person's tiny data. But the bigger data are now available in learners and learning to promote new scientific discoveries and advance the science of learning, to better assess learners along multiple dimensions, including not just the kind of classical, what does this kid know, but what is the learner's emotion, what is their metacognition, how are their social relationships developing during learning, and to understand uh, these things at individual, group, and institutional levels towards the goal of providing better real-time support for learners and better delayed support. So one of the things is, you know, as with most areas of data science, we're not just trying to develop better scientific theory or models, although that is a goal, but we're trying to develop better intervention and practice. There's a lot of types of educational data mining and learning analytics method. Um, in this audience, I assume I don't need to go into too much detail in defining what some of these areas are. But you know, prediction modeling, which is a standard area of uh, data mining and data science, things like classification and regression, are very much a prominent part of educational data mining. The problem of late knowledge estimation, assessing what students know, is a particularly prominent part of educational data mining. Um, structure discovery, so as well as standard things like clustering and factor analysis, there's also a big emphasis on figuring out the, domain, the models of domains. So for example, what mathematical skills correspond to what items, and what are the prerequisite relationships among them. And the Alex system developed here at McGraw-Hill actually is one of the most uh, advanced systems in terms of its model of the knowledge structure of mathematics. Um, relationship mining, you have relatively standard things like correlation mining and uh, association rule mining, sequential pattern mining. Also uh, joined by uh, a lot of attention to social network analysis and other types of network analysis. Um, distillation for data for human judgment, that's what we called it back in 09. I think visualization, the simpler term, is the better one. But you know, it was 2009. We were like, wearing our bell bottoms and our, <laughs> our big hairdos, and you know. For those of you who are new to this field, it's kind of mind boggling how fast things have changed. I mean, go back a decade, and you know, no one is using the term data science. And in education, you could fit everybody interested in educational data mining in one conference room, and it wasn't full. <laughs> and nowadays, there are literally thousands of papers being published each year in the area, and uh, terms have changed, and that's true of data science more generally. Uh, discovery of models, which is kind of as much an e-science and computational science thing, one of the big emphases in educational data mining has been developing models with relatively small sets of data, using things like prediction modeling, and then applying those data, those models after validation uh, to much larger data sets. And I'll give a couple examples of that later in the talk. So you know, some problems that you might see in prediction modeling include things like trying to predict which students are bored, or trying to predict which students will fail the class. You see a particularly large amount of research on predicting failure for things like dropout. And some of that research is really eye-opening and discovers new phenomena. And some of it is less uh, entertaining. You know, there was a joke among the EDM organizers for a few years that the paper we saw most often getting submitted was the paper that predicted students grade in the class. All you had to know was their grades on every assignment. <laughs> <laughs> you all laugh. <laughs> I've reviewed that paper like by different authors like six or seven times. <laughs> Big idea is to infer something that matters so we can better understand it and do something about it. That's a question. Yes, sir. About students being bored. Is that like by some kind of like like sensory thing, or is it more about like reaction, like clicker reaction? Great question. So I might have some slides later on boredom detection, I can't okay. remember. Because I don't remember if I do, but anyways, if I do, I'll spoiler. Um, you see models that make that inference from sensors, and you see the models that make it from interaction models. Um, I can recommend if you email me uh, some papers on both of those, some reviews. The, the brief version of the story is that the models based on sensors tend to be moderately better than the ones based on interaction logs, but the ones used in interact, based on interaction logs are much more scalable. Because getting physiological sensors into US classrooms is non-trivial. Um, <laughs> First of all, Lynn Burleson from uh, NYU found that there was a breakage rate of 60% per day for some of the more sophisticated sensors. 
11 year olds are very hard on electronic equipment. <laughs> and second of all, Shawnee Daly from Clemson uh, actually managed to get herself on both the Glenn Beck show and you know, Leonie Hames and Diane Ravitch's blog, which there aren't too many things in the world that uh, those people agree on, but they both agreed that she was evil. Uh, <laughs> or, um, for putting heart rate monitors on kids while they were learning. Um, you don't have those kind of risks with interaction models. When you can combine kinds of sensors, um, and my colleagues uh, Nigel, Bosch, and Sidney Mill showed, when you can combine the two types, you actually get a better model than either, because the physiological tends to be better in situations where you have available, but sometimes the sensors don't give accurate readings. If you've got a camera, sometimes kids' faces are blue, they have a hat on, or they're chewing gum, and you can't get a facial re react, facial expression. So the best stuff seems to kind of combine between the two when that's possible. Yes, sir. Um, if I email you um, which students are born who don't learn and which students are born who do learn the class material later on. So the question is whether some students are born but still learn? Yes. So some do. The correlation between boredom and learning is somewhere, I think, I think it's negative 0.18. Um, boredom is predictive, boredom as early as middle school is predictive of whether kids uh, go to college. So it's very predictive, but the correlation is pretty uh, imperfect. Um, some people think that boredom is common among kids who are very sharp, and they just get bored by class. That's probably true to some degree, but the research on that actually isn't, the evidence isn't very good for that. But you'll find that none of these things are perfect correlations anyways. The strongest things I'll talk about today are in the, are in the 0.35 to 0.4 range. Which, by the way, when you're thinking of correlations in a domain like this, does anyone know the correlation between cigarette smoking and lifespan is? It's negative 0.3. And we have a society decided that we're going to try to stop smoking, stop making smoking, we're going to ban it in restaurants, we're going to ban it in bars, on a correlation of negative 0.3. Correlation negative point three is actually colossal when you're dealing with highly complex phenomena in the real world. So, thank you. Great questions. Yes, sir. On, on a related note, are there time series kind of things on students being bored? For example, a teacher might teach something on the on Monday, pop quiz on Monday at the end of class. Student gets it the first day. Tuesday, they go over the same materials for the students that didn't get out on Monday, new pop quiz, Wednesday is a review before they move on. And is there any indication on sort of the gradation of the class, collective boredom, or individual students? The answer is no. No one's really done that analysis you're talking about that I'm aware of. People have done time series and, and uh, have done time-based analyses on boredom, but they've typically been in the span of minutes, not in the span of days. Email me. I think actually that it would be possible to do analyses like that, and I uh, I uh, would be happy to chat about it. But I haven't seen that one yet. Okay. One second, get to One of the things that's really kind of amazing is even though this has been an area for 11 years or 12 years now, there actually are still so many really obvious questions that no one has made time to answer. Even though the field has exploded. Most of the new people moving into it have researched the same relatively small set of questions. In fact, if anything, I would say that. A lot of the new energy has gone into pro has gone into just two or three problems. The problem of can you predict what the student knows, and the problem of can you predict who's going to fail. Sir? Do you distinguish between bored and off-task? Do I distinguish between bored and off-task behavior? Yes. I do. Um, they are detectable by different detectors, although they're correlated. Um, students who are bored are more likely to go off-task. They're also more likely to, do, to game the system, to try to get through without learning. It turns out that off-task behavior is actually a fairly productive response to boredom because students who get bored and go off-task tend to re-engage after a break. Students who do not go off-task tend to be less likely to re-engage. So ironically, even though a lot of teaching practice and classroom management practice is oriented towards reducing off-task behavior, actually it can be a fairly productive strategy. Now that said, a kid who's off-task 70 or 80% of the time um, is probably not productive. That's probably not a good break. That is how we intervene on, but we have to be more sensitive about when we intervene. One other thing that's kind of uh, fun about this, what was I saying? My brain just came out while I was in the middle Oh yeah, students who are currently off task tend not to be bored. Students who are currently off task tend to be having positive emotion because of the off task activity they're engaged in. 
Subordinate precedes off task, but it definitely doesn't co occur with it. Off task behavior actually resolves it. People are still studying that one. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things to predict. Um, one of the tricks is a lot of things to predict that aren't obviously actual. You know, um, bombing out on your assignments is not particularly is predictive, but not particularly actionable. Um, not opening the book. You can tell. Uh, a paper I did with David Lindrum, who we published one year ago, found that in courses that had an online textbook that logged access, whether or not you opened the textbook before the course started was an excellent predictor of whether you failed a class. Yeah. So there's a lot of predictors, a lot of them correlate to each other. Even though there's a ton of energy in it, it's not a solved problem yet. So. Thank you all for all the good questions. So structure discovery, you'll see people researching problems like what problems map to the same skill? Are there groups of students who approach the same curriculum differently? So can you cluster among the students in their behavior to see whether there's different approaches? Um, and things like which students develop more social relationships in massive online open courses? Turns out that your social relationships and MOOCs are actually very predictive of your outcomes in various ways. <clears throat> and in interesting ways, it's not just that the more social students are better, it's that students tend to assemble into cliques that are going to fail and cliques that are going to succeed. You'll have some students talking enthusiastically about the assignments and the concepts, and other groups talking enthusiastically about what color the instructor's shirt is. And you, you can probably guess which way those patterns are. <laughs> you should have worn my orange shirt today. That was a very controversial joke. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think I would probably want to use prediction modeling rather than structure discovery. Because if you know that you're looking for autism, um, <coughs> that's right. So the different, one of the differences between prediction modeling and structure discovery is structure discovery is what I'm going to use when you know nothing about the domain. You don't even know what you're looking for. You know there are groups, but you don't know which groups matter. Prediction modeling is when you know what you're supposed to be really looking for. That said, there hasn't been much research on predicting or inferring autism or other um, uh, disabilities. And the reason is because there are legal limitations on the access to that data. So whereas I can send an observer out to a classroom with an app and note down who's bored, in order to find out who has a disability, that's actually data that's protected, and so it's very hard to get, my, to get our hands on it. I suspect that, that uh, this is a case where we're trying to protect people and trying to protect privacy, but actually limiting our ability to intervene and make the world better. Sir? You're right, and I'm sure there is. I certainly don't want to diminish uh, the importance of the problem. I, uh, I think that I think that the key is it's going to be hard, and people right now are sort of are focusing on easier problems. You know, it's. it's People tend to get guided towards what's easy to do, right? Um, and one of the big things my lab has been doing for years is trying to find ways to take problems that look hard, like detecting emotion, and make them relatively easier. Sir? Could you use um, some data around the student activity and then predict which of the students have special needs versus the students have, like the reverse of it? Yeah, you can. I think the trick is that you still need labeled data in the first place to effectively build those models. And that's the information that's, kind of, that's protected. We'd have to get students whose parents volunteered them to participate, and that is non-trivial for various reasons. Not the least of which is just that any time you have to collect consent, you immediately uh, lose a large point of population, part of the population which doesn't even care to participate. Yes? Hi. Um, can I have a question with regard to what you're saying with uh, the uh, the same curriculum, the, the uh, curriculum different. Do you mean by uh, the learning styles of the students and how they are actually correlated to the learning outcomes? How are you going to discern that? There's some sort of an RCT structure that you're going to use in order to differentiate between what they're doing and how this is connected to the learning outcomes. Well, so you're asking a couple different questions. Um, the researchers who've researched this sort of thing tend to focus on learning strategies as opposed to learning styles. Yeah. 
That's because the learning styles of literature actually is quite complicated and um, open to debate. Uh, most of the classical learning styles, like visual or, visualizer or verbalizer, don't seem to have very good evidence for actually having an impact on educational outcomes. Yeah, this is one aspect. The other is towards surface and deep learning, right? So some people, some students are just, you know, approach to learning with surface approaches and some other with more different kind of approaches to learning, right? And this correlates with prior experiences of learning. And I would say that a lot of folks uh, use the term learning strategy or self-regulated learning to apply to that rather than learning styles. But either way, there's work, for example, by folks like Christina Conati um, at UBC that, lo that looks at trying to discover in a bottom-up fashion the different learning strategies that students are using in a new, in a new platform and then, tries to and then tries to classify based on that. Um, typically, people, when they look at those kind of behaviors, do correlational analyses uh, rather than doing RCTs. And the reason is because it's very difficult to assign somebody to a different learning strategy. Interventions that teach learning strategies um, also provide causal evidence on the benefit of the intervention, but not as obviously on the learning strategy yeah. itself. You can do an RCT with a known parametric analysis of the I've already done that. You can certainly do an RCT with a non-parametric analysis, but the issue of whether you use a non-parametric versus a parametric analysis is orthogonal, that's just whether you're dealing with data that's normally distributed or yeah. distributed across, according to another known distribution. Yeah. Uh, the issue I was mentioning was related to uh, inference of causality, which I think is hard to infer with these kind of with learning strategies. So, important, very valuable, but different. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm curious about the research you did for group of students in Are those groups you uh, assign them together, or they're actually they form themselves? So I actually won't take, I don't want to take, oh, you're talking about this one with the uh, groups the and the one groups. Above. I'm just curious about how the groups, or even in like other people's oh. research, how the group being formed. So um, in the work I was mentioning by Konadi, it's actually not groups working together. It's groups within the overall data. So Konadi found that approximately 30% of students, for example, used a more bottom-up approach, and a different portion used a more top-down approach. They weren't working together, but they independently had these strategies. You could, think, you could use the term clusters as well if you want to be more technical. There is work on group formation and studying group formation. People have uh, developed algorithms to try to assign groups. Um, the iStudy team at uh, Saskatchewan is a particularly good example of that. But a lot of the work in MOOCs has looked at how these teams form uh, independently. And they often form around issues of what they're most interested in talking about, or also linguistically. Linguistic groups are a big part of uh, MOOC group formation. But if you're grouping people around interest, like similar interest, does it increase diversity or does it decrease diversity? Um, well, your grouping implies a certain degree of, um, of intentionality. Um, the Saskatchewan folks group people not in terms of interest, but in terms of what they need to learn. And there are other things like that. I do think that if you group people based on interest, you are going to reduce the diversity to some extent. That may be a positive or negative thing, depending on the case. Um, relationship mining, among many other things, uh, there have been researchers that have looked at are there trajectories through a curriculum that are more or less effective. Some people, for example, uh, well, actually let me say teachers. Some teachers assign curricula in the designed order. Other teachers take things out of order and look at what the effects are. Some students do things in order, other students do things kind of go all over the place. And another area is which aspects of the design of educational software have implications for student engagement. Uh, one of the projects my lab has been researching is are there small scale differences in the design of learning materials that actually have big effects for um, engagement. One of the findings we have, I hope we'll share with everybody. Yeah, I'm um, on. Whoa. Anyways, oh well, so distractions are also an important thing to study. And you can say those things in data mining as well. Um, so one of the findings we have is that mathematics problems that are uh, have rich context and story around them are very engaging. Math problems with no context at all, just equations, are pretty engaging as well. But math problems that have very brief um, stories around them, like the kind of you know, really kind of boring, hokey math problems you might have seen in 